I often wondered when I first um, put an abstract in how I would go about telling other nurses how to do venisections. Well, I'm not going to be doing that. I just want to give you a bit of an open, um, a bit of information about why there's going to be an increasing need for nurse involvement in venisections. I'm going to cover all these areas, but I'm going to give you a bit of a spiel about Haemochromatosis Australia first. Um, our vision is that no Australian will experience harm from haemochromatosis. Remember that because I've got a scenario further down the track. Our mission is to provide support, information, resources and advocacy for people and family members who have been diagnosed with haemochromatosis as well as providing assistance for research. We are a national membership-based organisation run entirely by a management committee of eight volunteers supported by a number of volunteer advocates around the country. We work from our own homes. With the use of technology, we operate efficiently, managing our website, social media channels, membership system, telephone line inquiry system, which is staffed by four of us volunteers five days a week. We mail print resources free of charge to venisection clinics, medical practices and allied health professionals and the public on request. Our only source of income is via membership, subscriptions, donations and a small amount of fundraising from in raffles and an overload art ex um, exhibition. Haemochromatosis Australia was founded in 1996 by Margaret Rankin, a registered nurse who lives here in Queensland. I'm meeting her after this session. And with the help of, from Professor Laurie Powell, who, works, who has been one of the most eminent researchers in haemochromatosis in the world. And the, both of them are our patrons today. We have an excellent um, number of medical advisors, all who are being involved in research. Now I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you have Caucasian ancestry? Hands up. Okay, one in seven of you will be C282Y homozygous. One in 200 will be C282Y, I mean, sorry, heterozygous for the one in seven, and homozygous for one in 200, and I'm a homozygous. Hard to say, simple to test, easy to treat, tragic to ignore. Early symptoms can be mistaken from many other health disorders, and these include thyroid problems, anemia, chronic fatigue syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome and depression. Now, how many other chronic health disorders are there with that? The late symptoms will be a result of the excess iron leading to toxic damage to the liver, which can lead to cirrhosis and or cancer. And how many people have I heard of who have been diagnosed with, with cirrhosis of the liver and haemochromatosis when they're having a liver transplant and they have been accused of being alcoholics up until their diagnosis? The heart, which can lead to arrhythmias, cardiomyopathy and heart failure. The joints, to a worsening of and cause of arthritic symptoms which lead to early age joint replacements. I've had three, my first at 58. The pancreas, which can lead to the development of diabetes too and if haemochromatosis is picked up early, nine times out of ten that diabetes too will be fixed once their iron level goes down. The skin, bronze to slate grey discoloration like an all over body tan without a sun baking history. I've asked people have they sun baked naked sometimes just to make, explain that. Okay. The management of haemochromatosis is deioning as quickly and safely as possible when ferritin is moderate to high. This can include twice a week, weekly, every two weeks, monthly, second monthly or when on maintenance approximately three monthly for the rest of our lives. Our veins need to be cared for when venesection is performed, especially when the frequency is weekly. Haemochromatosis cannot be managed by diet and I can't stress that more. Now this is my heartbreaking scenario. This was an info line call that I received in 2012. His wife phoned, that his hus her husband was in his mid-50s in age, who had been told that he did not have hemochromatosis when diagnosed, um, when tested eight years earlier. At the time of the call, he had been correctly diagnosed as C282I homozygous with a ferritin level of 11,600. How many of you know what the normal range is for a man? Yeah, upper limit of 300. 
At that stage, he already had severe cirrhosis, heart disease, unstable diabetes, and severe arthritic problems, just to name a few, and he was not an alcoholic. This type of scenario is what keeps me motivated to provide information and support and advocacy for people with hemochromatosis and to assist the committee in promoting our work to health professionals, such as yourselves, the general community, and with the aim to encourage early diagnosis and management so we can avoid major health problems due to iron overload. Some of you may be aware, some of you may not, that a hemochromatosis health pathway is now available in 15 primary health networks, largely through the efforts of one of our volunteer advocates, and in your satchels you'll find a list of those primary health networks. Okay, current access to therapeutic venesection, for most of you you'll know this, for some of us as haemochromatosis patients, Red Cross is not an option, especially if they do not meet the normal criteria for blood donors. Reasons for exclusion, as you probably all are aware, is the development of unstable diabetes, heart disease, age, unfortunately we all get a bit older, having lived in England during the mad cow disease time, and unfortunately they do not like hard veins, so spindly veins, which creates a problem in finding an adequate vein quickly. Living in a remote area of Australia can be a problem also with Red Cross because they do not revisit all regional and remote areas. But the plus side of Red Cross is that they will use the blood of hemochromatosis patients for donations as long as all of the donor criteria are met. We are a very valuable source of blood and we encourage all our members to go to Red Cross for as long as they're able to. If GPs need to refer patients to Red Cross they can do so using the online High Ferritin app which is accessed at our website. There are numerous private pathology centres around Australia performing venesections. There are many hospital departments, uh, including oncology units, haematology department, gastroenterology department, day surgery, outpatient units, and in remote and regional areas may be performed in community health centres. And I heard one interesting story a little while ago, which I won't repeat. There are a number of infusion clinics in Australia who also perform venesections, and there are an increasing number of GP clinics. Oh God, have I not finished? <gasps> Oh, I haven't said all I want to do. Um, and GP clinics are a valuable source of venesections for many of our people. And we have a GP um, liaison officer who has helped regional and remote clinics to learn how to do venesections and will do so. And this is one of the things. The first paper here was to demonstrate if people with hemochromatosis would benefit with venesections between 300 and 1,000. In between 2012 and 2016, this study was a multi-centre, participant-blinded, randomised controlled trial done at three centres around Australia. They were randomly assigned to undergo either iron reduction by erythrocytophoresis, I can never say that word, the treatment group, or sham treatment by plasmapheresis, the control group. The outcome of this study provided evidence that all individuals with hemochromatosis who have iron overload above the normal level, not above 1,000, would benefit from normalisation of body iron. That is one of the reasons why there'll be an increased number. This one, Jessica's paper, she did a regional one, a qualitative study, and some of the major points that came out of this was, as we know everywhere, delayed diagnosis is a problem in many instances. The participants described a variety of locations where they obtained their venesection, which we've mentioned some of, but in remote areas. They can travel 200 to 400 kilometres or more to have a venesection, that's one way. And that can prove very challenging. One of the things that really came out of this paper that I really um, think we need to stress for nurses is, venous access following repeated venesection was highlighted as an issue for those with hemochromatosis. The role of nurses who are experienced in venesection technique is as important for staining regular venesection. This is very important as poor technique can lead to over time to the veins become difficult to access and we need the rest of our lives to last for them to last. Um, I'll miss that bit out because that's not this important. So increasing the need, there is still a, going to be an increasing number of people diagnosed with hemochromatosis due to people being more informed cascade screening, greater community awareness and as a result of the outcome of the results of the MI-Iron study. This will have a roll-on effect where there will be an increased need for more and more nurses being involved with venesection procedure in their workplace. Remember some people are di when diagnosed with any disorder are very stressed and anxious and this is because they know nothing about the disorder 
and if not supported well may not come back for further venesection or management with the outcome being major health problems. In these cases, nurses are a very valuable source of support and care. They need to be able to provide encouragement, information and know where to refer patients if needed and be experienced in managing hemochromatosis of intersections. Okay, hemochromatosis and apnea have worked very closely together with one of our GPs and a, a clinical nurse consultant from Wangaratta East Health, which I passed my thank you on. And we have developed an apnea online learning um, course, Hemochromatosis for Nurses, which is on the APNA website under your learning portal. Um, and that only came live early this year. And the other one is the Rural and Remote Medical Education Online. That was developed by Dr Katie Goot, who is also a regional doctor and from Billalea somewhere. And um, nurses are able to access that as well. So you can take that back to your GPs. Just briefly, we, are now, we have been a member of Hemochromatosis International for quite a while and recently over the last couple of years they have worked together to, to make it a more formal group and advised us that the inaugural World Hem Hemochromatosis Awareness Week will be the 4th to the 10th of June. Any of you who knew when we had it before know it would have been in August but now, from now on it will be in June. In any centre wishing to have a display during this time, please contact us for resources. Um, some of these, these are some of our resources that we have. And I shouldn't have thrown them onto the floor. It's a little booklet some of you may have met, a little vendor section record book. And this is a much bigger book which has cost $15. If they become a member of us they get that for nothing, but if practices want it, there is a cost unfortunately. And plus there's a little flyer. Um, there are all the references and if anyone wants any of those new papers, those first two papers that I talked about have only been released in the last two months, or um, not released, published in the last two months. And the same with the one that the, um, the international organisation has now um, ruled that we have to keep people's ferritin as close to 50 as possible. Australia have been doing that for quite a few years, or actually forever. And so the rest of the world are catching up with us. And if you want to contact me, my card's on the table for anyone. Um, or if you're, quite, if you're quick, write down the email addresses or the phone.